I'm Aaron Maté sitting in for Jimmy Dore here with Americans comedian Kurt Metzger and special in-studio guest Jimmy Dore. Hi, it's good hey. to be here. Thanks for having me. You guys are doing fantastic work. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And uh, here is some sad news to report. Harry Belafonte dies. Barrier-breaking singer, actor, and activist. Harry Belafonte dying at the age of 96. Uh, Well-known as an entertainer, but also as an activist. A key figure behind the civil rights movement. I uh, was a close friend of Dr. King's, helped fund his movement, and has stayed very close to the King family uh, ever since. Well, Harry Belafonte was an outspoken activist on so many issues, and here he is speaking uh, about the Democratic Party. You know, the, uh, the last thing Dr. King said to me before he was murdered was in my home when we were sitting planning strategy for the poor people's campaign which was on the horizon of the politics of the day that's why he went to memphis and in the course of that meeting he seemed distracted and a little on the on the focused and when we asked him what was the matter martin said you know I've been thinking long and hard about our struggle. We worked tenaciously for our rights. And uh, the culmination of all that effort will be reflected in what we've come to call the integration movement. And I sit here deeply concerned that I suspect we are leading our nation on an integration trip that has us integrating into a burning house. Well, bam! <laughs> bam! Keep going, keep going. Keep I don't think we quite understood how pathetic that remark was. After all, we're in the midst of a very heady moment in our struggle. We were winning on a lot of frontiers. Bull Connor had been confronted. The bus boycotts had worked. Votes were coming. Uh, even Lyndon Baines Johnson had been uh, struck by the spirit and got up and talked about we shall overcome in the Congress. And uh, for Dr. King to have been in this place at a time when we seemed to be making great headway was a moment to pause and reflect. That reflection has taken longer than I had suspected it would, but it has certainly come to reveal itself fully when we look at the condition in which we find not only our world, but in particular, our nation. The wreckage that's taking place down in the Gulf region, in the southwest part of the United States, is not the only wreckage that exists. We have a lot of wreckages around this country. And perhaps the most distracting and perhaps the most important wreckage to take a look at is really the wreckage of the Democratic Party. Charlie, Charlie. Harry Belafonte is saying this as he's sitting next to then candidates <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. I don't know if she was. A, oh, yeah, she did run in 2008. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's he's, wrecked really bad. <laughs> <laughs> She's going hey, totally. So, <laughs> and by just keep in mind, things have only gotten a hundred times worse since when he said all this stuff. And he's saying it right in their faces. And he's the real deal. And he doesn't yet know Barack Obama is a phony. Go ahead, kid. Get him to the stage. I've been a Democrat all my life. I have no I have no treaty with the Republicans. Nor do I nor do I really seek one. But the Democratic Party was not always our friend. As a matter of fact, a lot of what we had to struggle against was in the possession and the power of Democrats who came from the South. And when we showed them the tenaciousness and the conviction and the sense of great purpose that the people of this nation had into transforming our condition, all those Democrats from the South ran off and became Republicans as an, 
What are they supposed to do? As an act of punishment <laughs> for what we were trying to achieve <laughs> as a people. And that keep going, keep going. punishment continues to play itself out. Eleanor Roosevelt was a close friend. And once sitting in Hyde Park with her, she told a story about a great black leader by the name of A. Philip Randolph. He was one of the great giants of the century, certainly one of the great thinkers. And she recalled an evening when A. Philip Randolph had been invited to a dinner at the White House. And uh, just he, her, and the president, Franklin Roosevelt. And during the course of the dinner, the president invited Mr. Randolph to speak his thoughts. And for a long time, A. Philip Randolph held forth on every list of grievances he could think of for the people in the labor movement, for the people who were poor, for black people. And Roosevelt permitted him to hold forth without any interruption until he concluded. At the end of it, Roosevelt reached for a box of cigars, passed one around to Philip. And as he slowly lit the cigar, he turned to Philip Randolph and he said, Philip, let me tell you, I've heard everything you've said. I've missed absolutely nothing. And there's nothing that you've said that I disagree with. And I do, in fact, have the platform to be able to make the transformation work that you're looking for. And I guess we're all looking for. I have just one request of you. And it is for you to go out and make me do it. It seems to me that there will be no loftier statements and no greater speeches to be made than have already been made. Certainly Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Fannie Lou Hamer down in Atlantic City when she challenged with the Freedom Mississippi Democratic Party. There are a lot of people who have made speeches that are as eloquent as will ever be written. And we've listened to a lot of redundancy. A lot of people who have carefully selected the phrases and applied them to the moment. I think he's talking about Obama. I think he's talking about Obama too. <laughs> <laughs> What eludes us is the bankruptcy of the action itself. Mm. This poverty that our country is witnessing has never gone away. Most of the politicians I know of have visited these places of poverty. They make it their business when they're running for the highest office in this nation to go into the heart of our pain, our anguish, our indignities, and make promises only to walk into the places of power and then deny us. Exactly. And that's exactly what both those people did sitting here. next to him. That's exactly what both those people did sitting next to him. Barack Obama used those phrases, applied them to the to, from the 60s, 50s and 60s, applied them uh, to his campaign, and uh, but he didn't have any action behind him. So he's talking about the bankruptcy of the action. And uh, there it is. I mean, he's saying it right. And he's predicting that with Barack Obama's uh, presidency and it came true. OK, let's see what's more what he has to say. Oh, is that it? That's it. OK, wow. That was uh, and he said it right in front of him. And that was in 2007 during that primary. Yeah. yeah. With Hillary and Obama. Yeah. Yep. And uh, they just sit there and they're like, hey, uh, we're all we're phonies <laughs> and he doesn't get it. He's an actor. The actor is the guy who's more real. The guy who plays pretend for I a know, living is wild. more real than the politicians who are supposed to be actually solving our problems. And of course, they're all about self dealing. And Barack Obama also was. Is that why it's called ugly showbiz or ugly Hollywood? I think so. Um, what the, that, that, that was amazing to hear him say, is there anything worth salvaging in the democratic party? And there isn't. That that part where he talks about the tactic of sounding really noble and lofty by, you know, repackaging old speeches and old rhetoric to sound. It's like Obama heard that part. It was like, all right. Yeah, I think I'll do that. I'll keep doing that. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> Say what you want, Harry. It works. It really works. It's gonna, I'm going to become president before, uh, before you know it. Harry's recognizing my talent. <laughs> 
Um, so we lost a, a real one when, when we lost Harry Belafonte. Um, it would, uh, you know, the, Cornel West and um, Tavis Smiley during <laughs> President Obama's tenure as president, they went on a poor people's campaign around the country. And of course, when they would go on CNN, they would mock them. Yeah, right. And they're like, what are you talking about? Barack Obama, everybody loves him. And they're like, he's not doing anything for anybody. And because he was governing like Mitt Romney, right? <laughs> that was the that was the irony. Yeah, right. Well, the joke I used to do was that, uh, you know, we had to, they told us I had to vote for uh, Barack Obama or else I was going to get Romney care. So I made sure I bro voted for Barack Obama and we got Romney care. So <laughs> if you're given a choice of two Mitt Romneys, you're not going to vote for the black Mitt Romney? <laughs> <laughs> That's racist. <laughs> okay, let's see what else you got on there. Here's Harry Belafonte during the Vietnam War era. I fought in the Second World War. I was in the United States Navy. I was told then, and I fought with the knowledge that this was the war to end all wars. Oh, that God. we were going to defeat fascism and mankind oh. could turn its attention to the best that was in man. God damn. But now I come and my son is 10 years old. And I will arm him with everything that I can so that he will be free of any primitive, medieval, you know, concepts about false patriotism, about boundaries, about the meaning of flags. You know, mankind is much bigger than all of these primitive symbols. And I don't want to see my boy with his face uh, stuck in some rice paddy off in Vietnam or off in some other land protecting the interests of the establishment and, and trying to reward their greed with his life. Uh, I'm opposed to it. And I don't want him to be armed with a sense of being able to go off and destroy another human being anywhere in the world whom he's never known. It's, 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 it's inhuman. It's terrible. And the reason I hang around is to make sure that uh, in my old age, if I live to see it, that... Uh, I will be able to say that in my lifetime, I, I did all that I could with what was at my disposal because I would hate for my children to look at me and to say, uh, where were you during the moment of the great decision? Wow. Wow. So that, again, he was a real one and he was, uh, he did stop. Um, and maybe that's why you never saw him on MSNBC or CNN since 2008. Maybe that's why, because he was going to poke a hole in their neoliberal bubble. And uh, that's why they stopped bringing on Glenn Greenwald they, that's, and Matt Taibbi. Okay, what's that, what else you got for me? Here's a thread from Michael Harriet on Twitter. Top 10 crazy stories about Harry Belafonte. There was a time when he hopped on a plane with a bag stuffed with $70,000 and dodged the Ku Klux Klan to save the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Really? There was the fact that because he was cool with the black power leaders and the nonviolent resistance advocates, his apartment was basically the spot where civil rights leaders settled their beef. Belafonte was so paranoid about being spied on and mistrusting women that he went to therapy. He eventually hired his therapist husband who managed Frank Sinatra as his manager. His paranoia eventually made him <laughs> fire uh -huh. them both. Uh, Harry Belafonte was the one who bailed out MLK in Birmingham when he, was, when he wrote the infamous letter from a Birmingham jail condemning white moderates. He also funded the Freedom Rides. Belafonte never took credit for the idea alone, but he helped push the idea of sending white kids down to Mississippi for Freedom Summer and the Freedom Rides, which he helped fund. One of those was John C. Raines, a white minister who was a Freedom Rider and at Freedom Summer. Raines was just, was just an advocate for peace, was not just an advocate for peace, I think he meant to say, until he was arrested on, oh, Reigns was just an advocate for peace until he was arrested on the Freedom Rides. Then a white kid just like him was murdered during Freedom Summer. Then Viola Luizo happened. Then white terrorists in Selma killed James Reeb, a minister like Reigns. He was radicalized. On March 8th, 1971, when, while Belafonte was watching the Ali Frazier fight, Reigns and his friends broke into the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania and stole a bunch of files. The files they stole were the first solid evidence oh of COINTELPRO. God. It's how we know about Gary Rowe. Rowe was a Klansman and a paid FBI informant who probably participated in the 16th Street Baptist bombing, the attack on the Freedom Riders, the murder of Viola Luizzo, among other things. It's how we know the FBI was spying on King, the Black Panthers, and the Civil Rights Movement. It's how we know the FBI... It's how we know the FBI 
willed Fred Hampton and Marcus Garvey and every significant black movement that ever existed. I think that means that uh, she FBI, willed, uh, you know, undermined or in the case of Fred Hampton, killed Fred yeah. Hampton and every significant black oh. movement that ever killed. I, I think you meant to say killed. Yeah. No. Um, oh. <laughs> how did they do it? Well, someone infiltrated the inner circle of civil rights leaders from every generation and was reporting it back to the CIA and FBI. So, you know, this is Harry, Harry Belafonte's role in so many significant uh, historical events and exposing so many crimes. Boy, that FBI, huh? Those guys, they're <laughs> always up to something. I you, like their King quote posters. What? Remember that? <laughs> their, their new, the uh, what do you call it? marketing for oh, they have the words of Dr. King? They, the FBI Monday was K doing Day. that? Yeah, we co showed it on here. It was Did we, we covered it? Yeah, there was like a joke about them spying on him. Oh, he's got some points. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. And this is why we showed that note about the uh, Harry Belafonte's therapist, because it turns out this, the therapist and her husband were spies. Oh, no! J. Richard Kennedy was one of the main sources for the FBI until he started a cult. It's crazy. So Harry Belafonte's therapist was apparently a spy. Oh, so he was right to he fire. He was right, Absolutely. Yep. And so Frank Sinatra's manager was a spy. Makes sense to me. Yep. Yep. Well, because he was in bed with Kennedy. And they, I'm sure they want to keep. Also, they had uh, the connections with the mafia. The, yes, since of course. Back then, and they used the mafia to help. Who's that mafia guy that all those ones that are really bad killers? They always had like a connection with somebody. Yeah, Sammy so, Giancana. Well, uh, the guy that went for the, he ended up dying at like AIDS because he, 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 but he, the Mississippi burning. When the mob guy goes, you know, it's based on that. They sent uh, Scarpa. His name's uh, Scarpa. Oh, okay. they, the Grim Reaper was his nickname. And he, he did something horrendous during the, uh, after those those uh, white kids got killed for uh, going down for the Mississippi thing. You know right. what I'm talking about, right? No, I don't. I don't, no, I don't. Mississippi Burning's about that thing he's talking about. Those kids getting movie. killed. Oh. It's fictionalized, but it's based on that. But those okay. Freedom Rides, there were two white kids and two black kids that got killed by Klansmen. I think like the sheriff was in on it, and all, and, and uh, the Scarpa was sent down there by the FBI and tortured somebody and got some kind of information. Really, Greg Scarpa—that's his name. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, I mean, the FBI, the CIA, the mob—they work together all the time. This was Whitney Webb books are about. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that's. I mean, didn't didn't they have something to do? With, well, the Cook County, right? I mean, that's what got JFK elected, and <laughs> the mob. That's what a lot of people point to, right? All the mobsters that now. I don't know if you know the whole mafia has a podcast now, but <laughs> <laughs> they give you all the backstory. And, um, <laughs> the the talk, the talk is they they felt like we could put this guy in office, and then what his brother's going to come down on us, and they didn't like him. Here's a. Uh, Here's one more clip. I've never seen this one. Uh, during the taping of We Are the World, around 2 a.m., Al Jarreau, Ray Charles, Smokey Robinson start singing Mr. Belafonte's signature song, the Banana Boat song, uh, with Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones and Bob Dylan all around. Okay, stop. I've had enough Harry Belafonte. I mean, I mean, Al Jarreau. Al Jarreau. Yeah. I was never a big Al Jarreau fan. He's a Jehovah's Witness. Is he? I don't know if he is mm -hmm. now, but he was when I was a kid. Yeah, that's why I only. That's the reason I would know. I never wanted to go Jarreau. dancing in the garden. Is that what it was? It was his big song. Oh. Is anyone want to go dancing in the garden? <laughs> Does anyone want to go dancing on the roof? Remember that song? No, am I wrong? <laughs> well, I, that was my era. I'm older than Harry everybody. Harry Belafonte should have sang that song. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. So, I, yeah, uh, anyway, so. Well, that's it. That's our tribute to Harry Belafonte. Um, Harry Belafonte, what a legend. Do you think we'll ever have, do you think we'll, we'll ever have celebrities like that again? No. I don't think so. 
Well, we do. Well, we have Ben Stiller and, uh, and <laughs> Sean, Penn. Sean Penn. I mean, come on. They, they. Oh, I'm sorry to be guys who go and push back against the CIA and the FBI, like Harry Belafonte, instead of being in bed with them. Yeah. That's like, crazy that that's true that they were spies. Like I, isn't I was that like, crazy? oh, he was kind of yeah. paranoid. I saw the first part and I was like, Jesus. You think Harry Belafonte called up Sean Penn and, and uh, before he died and said, "Hey, what the fuck." <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Or Ben Stiller, at least. But Ben Stiller's a real heartbreaker for me because I really love his movies. Me too. He's really... And, well, Tropic Thunder may be the best comedy ever, but yeah. right up there with Young Frankenstein. It's a fantastic comedy. I love Young Frankenstein, too. Yeah. Not in the mold of Harry Belafonte, that's for sure. No, these guys today, they're all soft. They're all soft. Sean Penn. Was he a saint, like a music guy first and then an actor? Harry what? Belafonte? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he sure. sang that song. Yeah, so... Cause those, that was his big song. Those guys are like actors first, aren't they? There's something about people that get into acting Actor from other then, things. Yeah. That they have more balls a little bit, you know? <laughs> people, yeah, I get, I get, well, yeah. Actors are so purely a certain way. Yeah, Frank Sinatra be a singer, then he became an actor. Same thing yeah. with Dean Martin and stuff like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah like, yeah. it's just the attitude of, like, being a sycophant to <laughs> the feeling of, uh, I don't know. There's just something about pure actors that makes them great as, like, Puppets for puppets psyops, for the, you know? yeah, for the intelligence community. Yeah. They they sure are bad. There's, What's my motivation? <laughs> Tell me <laughs> to do the bidding of the establishment, Sean. Okay, all right. Let me pump up. I got to do some acting. We're telling jokes in Nashville, Honolulu, Los Angeles, Northampton, Massachusetts, Syracuse, Cohoes, New York, Hartford, Connecticut, Baltimore, Chicago, Rosemont, San Diego, and more. Go to JimmyDoor.com to see, get a link for all those tickets. Plus, you can watch my new special, COVID Lies Are Funny. <laughs> <laughs>